We are in this room to talk about the future. Uh, I am an editor at, uh, at Time Magazine, based in New York. My name is John Simons. And um, as an editor, I want to do one thing uh, very quickly first, is cross out the, uh, the future of. It seems like the, the future is very much here, um, as, as we've been talking about this morning with, um, with the rise of, of generative AI um, in, our, in our, all of our lives. Um, so we're, we're here to talk about very much about the present and about assessment in, in higher education and K through 12. Um, I have a daughter who started her first year of university, and I, I just want to chime in on one thing about how she said her professors are reacting to uh, chat GPT being used across campus. She's heard of at least one professor who said, go ahead and use it, um, but I have three stipulations. One, check the facts, because for whatever reason, it's not very good at, uh, it, can be, it, can, it can draw in uh, incorrect, factual uh, information. Two, make it your own. It will, it will spit out um, very nicely worded text, but go ahead and, and sort of be creative. Make it your own. Edit the work and, and be creative with it. And the third is, I'm raising my standards now. There's no more excuses for bad writing. <laughs> so with that, I'm, uh, I'm going to pose my first question to you, Ollie. Um, what, are the, what are the right systems and methods today for assessing how well education systems are doing? Thank you very much for that. Very interesting question, and, and I'm, I'm not going to actually try to answer what you asked. So on the system level, because it would be so interesting to tackle the question on the, on the individual level or on the school level. But looking at the individual level or, or the system level, um, I, I've been kind of on that level actually for 30 years thinking about the connection with the te between technology and education. And the more that I study and try to understand the technology, the more I find that I come to the core of education. And I think that the main thing on a system level really is to be clear what is the purpose of education. What is the purpose for a school or a society or a nation to make an education system? Because if we are not clear on that question, assessment is pretty difficult to succeed. Because you don't know what you're, what, what you're assessing. My kind of second point is that you can have the world's best assessment system if the other elements of the education system are not in shape, the teacher education training, the, the curriculum side, and so on, it doesn't help. So assessment must always be developed kind of aligned with the other elements. And maybe, keep it short, my third point is that um, the hardest part of assessment is the interpretation of the data that you're getting on the system level. Because there are, we are doing it as humans, and we do have those confirmation biases that we want to see the results as what are our existing thinking. We talked about what the purpose of education is. What is it, what is the answer to that question for you? What is the main purpose of education? I see it twofold. There is still in the future, we have the responsibility to give the new generations 
everything we as humans have been able to achieve so far. All the culture, sciences, arts, everything. But the other part is coming more important, and that is to give the new generations the competencies and skills they will be needing building their own future. And then we are not only talking about the skills, but we are talking about agency, and we are talking about motivation, kind of character type of issues. So the kind of holistic education and enabling to grow of the young students is becoming more and more important. Since we're, we're talking a lot about about societal change and the role technology is playing now in education. Um, does this mean that the way that students are assessed, the way that education systems are assessed, should, should change? Are we, are we at an inflection point here in terms of what we should be, what we should be assessing, what we should be testing? I don't know. Or, or is that, is that a constant? In the past, we had a variety of assessments uh, that were largely to uh, provide gateways um, or uh, opportunities to move from one stage to the other. Um, assessments during your schooling years, assessments to enter university, assessments even in the hiring process to start a job. And these life stages, if you will, are starting to get reimagined at work. And, uh, this notion of competencies or skills are starting to become more important. And so the future of assessments, which as you said is now becoming increasingly the present of assessments, is really at the competency level, is really increasingly becoming more and more critical. So while assessments will continue to play a role to see if you pass a course or finish high school or enter college or hiring assessments, these stage assessments that are the macro assessments that we think of, Increasingly, assessments are about measuring these micro skills. Are you developing critical thinking skills? Are you seeing emotional management, collaboration skills? A lot of the, of the two purposes you mentioned, the social side and the economic purpose of education, it's those economic competencies, those competencies about relevance to work, digital literacy, to interpret what's happening in social media. These skill-based competencies are going to be increasingly the focus of the future of assessment. Janet, I saw you nodding quite a bit while I was asking the question and while Amit was answering. What do you, what do you think about this? Are we, are we at a point where assessment needs to change? I mean, my, my daughter took the, the SAT and there's a writing section on the SAT where they test your ability to put your thoughts together in a, in a sort of coherent way. Uh, is that necessary anymore when she can now go to ChatGPT and it can do that for her? Great questions and love the comments. And again, thank you for the invitation as well. Um, assessment must follow what uh, the goals of the education system are. Uh, assessment by itself, decontextualized, it, it, they're not valid, they're not reliable, they're not going to generate the information that people need to make good decisions. So. Uh, as, as our curriculum changes, as our goals for education uh, evolve, um, assessment must evolve. So we've talked a lot about ch chat GPT and AI and the changing of the, the tools that students can use. Do, do, do students need to generate essays on their own anymore? I would, I would suggest yes. Ch chat GPT is a wonderful tool and can help uh, students uh, learn, progress, but at some point, individuals do need to be able to have those competencies themselves uh, to be able to perform, whether it's in an academic setting or in a work setting. The other thing I would say, if we believe that education's, uh, one of the education's primary goals is to develop leaders, individuals who can work with others to uh, be good citizens, to uh, you know, be employees and employers and generate you know, economic stability in your countries, Individuals have to learn how to work with each other. Um, ChatGBT and all the AI and all the technology in the world are amazing tools and we should embrace them. But we still need to be able to have a conversation. I need to, need to still have empathy for the people that I'm working with and understand where they're coming from. I need to be able to collaborate 
with people on teams to, to set goals and then to work together to achieve those goals. And those are sort of the intangibles or the soft skills that we've been talking a lot about. And as those become more important in this world of, of, of heavy focus on technology, our curriculum and our assessments need to evolve to be able to get a better understanding of those leadership skills and those soft skills. Well, as a journalist, I, I thank you for that answer because I, I use those soft skills every day, visiting people and visiting companies, writing about businesses and leaders. And um, right now, I'm not afraid that ChatGPT is going to <laughs> supplant me, um, but maybe maybe at some point in the future. Hadi, um, you know, I'm sorry to ask so many questions and, and focus on, on my daughter, but she is in her first year of university and she came to me and, and wanted to take a, a coding class. She's studying literature and philosophy. Um, do, you, do you recommend coding in terms of, uh, you know, helping students learn how to think in a different way? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. Uh, and I first wanted to say how unusual it is to me have, to have come here from America where in New York City they're banning ChatGPT. Yeah. And in the United Arab Emirates they're saying we are going to embrace this in our uh, education yeah. system. Really forward, forward thinking and it's great yeah. to see that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, and I also agree with the, uh, uh, the previous comment that assessment should test the purpose of education, the purpose of curriculum. And what I think ChatGPT has shown all of us, and this isn't a new idea, but it just has forced it on us, is that the purpose of education has to change and adapt with increasing technology. Uh, and assessments with it should test the new purpose of education. We no longer should be teaching rote memorization, manual skills that are no longer used in, a, in the workplace. Our workplace expects people to know critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration, creativity, and digital skills. But our schools aren't teaching those things quite the same way. They're teaching repetitive things that a computer can do for you. And so when you asked, should we teach coding, the best reason to teach coding in computer science isn't to prepare future coders, it's to prepare future thinkers, problem solvers, creators, and collaborators. There is no better course to teach 21st century collaboration and creativity than computer science. You work on a project together, you collaborate, you create an app or a website or a game, you learn digital skills, and that should be what we assess. All right, so with that in mind, how do we now, let's, let's brainstorm here, how do we change assessment to measure these, these things, like how, how would you measure soft skills? Someone's ability to have a good conversation with someone else and draw out some facts and, and uh, feelings and, and so on from, from a coworker or someone you need to manage. Um, how, would, how do we test those? It's hard. How do we test for those? Hard to do it with a multiple choice test, I'm just gonna say. Um, <laughs> those paper, paper bubbling things, they're gonna go away. Um, it's the, the, those sorts of assessments that you're describing are going to be much more interactive, performance-based, um, could be through simulations perhaps, if you start thinking about metaverse and um, potential interactions in an environment like that. Now that's even beyond what we've been talking about with ChatGPT, but there's opportunities there, I think, if we can think about how to simulate the human interaction in a context and then have uh, the ability through observation or rubrics to be able to assess the, the, the quality with which uh, a learner interacted in a, in a goal setting collaboration environment. So the assessments do need to evolve. They, they must be more performance based. They must have um, uh, you know, different sorts of rubrics for assessing, as, uh, for scoring as yeah. well. So, Amit, what, yeah. do you, what do you think about that? Yeah. Can you incorporate, do you, do, you, do you think you could incorporate the metaverse somehow into, <laughs> uh, into testing? Absolutely. At, at ETS, we produce about 25 million tests every year, and each of them have hundreds of different questions associated with it. Historically, um, like ACT, ETS, and other assessment providers, focus primarily on cognitive skills, because that's what society was wa wanting to be tested on, problem solving, uh, the ability to reason. 
So more of the cognitive, right brain type of skills. As we move forward, we're really confident that the world is shifting in a way where we're looking for more of the whole person approach to assessing. And so we're calling that ABCs of assessment. So there's affective skills, behavioral skills, and then cognitive skills. So the cognitive, we've got lots of testing for cognitive, but the affective skills, the leadership, the collaboration, the emotional management, or the behavioral skills, which are more the applied skills, those are increasingly becoming important. Employers, universities, schools want to see more different dimensions of the individual, not just the logic and reasoning side. So in terms of the metaverse, absolutely, you can imagine if you want to assess someone's ability to apply communication skills. Not just can I do grammar, uh, but can I actually communicate? You can use uh, simulations and metaverse type of to uh, tools to enable you to demonstrate that competency. And AI is becoming increasingly important. You're seeing now AI used for interview skills, where you can, I can be interviewing another individual, and behind the scenes, I'm getting an AI uh, technology helping me to assess that person's presence, that person's likelihood of demonstrating positive interactive skills. So it's, it's extraordinary how many different types of tools are now available. But the key is that going beyond cognitive skills, going to these affective, behavioral, and other dimensions to really get that sense of the whole person. Yeah. Ollie, what do you think about, about this? And also, what are some ways that assessment might change to incorporate all the changes that we're seeing now in society and in education? Well, looking at that question, also on how we're thinking at the International Baccalaureate about developing our programs and the assessment in connection to that, um, we don't have that many tests in, in our programs, but we do have an, a diploma program, high stakes, end of study test there. Um, and what we are looking for is also kind of other types of assessment during the studies. Because um, I, I think the, the digital technologies, they can really give added value in three different ways. It's the content, it's the context, and it's the community of learning that can be actually more real, so strange that word sounds when we talk about meta spe kind of environment, but, but that's what the possibilities are. And then it's really that how to that interaction that is connected to many of the important skills that are the effective ones, for example, or, or the context. Those skills are usually shown in a certain context. They are very context-bound often. And then there's the question that how can we build data points along the educational programs in a way that makes sense, doesn't come bureaucratic, and also doesn't come kind of surveillance mechanisms for the students to feel anxious every day they go to school. So, so those are the kind of challenges. There's a lot of ethical questions with assessment. And I think we have to be very careful not to assess everything that is possible to assess. Yeah. Adi, are, you, are any ideas being sparked here for ways that you might create applications that can, can assess some of these, uh, these soft skills that we're talking about? Sure. I have I have two very specific ideas on a new way of teaching that can not only teach digital skills, but also assess these soft skills in a world where generative AI can do so much. Uh, one comes from my work at code.org where we have you know, 70 million students learning to code. Our fastest growing assessment, the advanced placement exam in computer science, doesn't test your ability to code. It tests your creativity. You actually submit a portfolio of the apps you can create. And you can do these collaboratively on a team to test your collaboration. And then you're judged by, was this an interesting app? Not only was it technically good, but also was it creative? And if you worked on a team, how did that work out? And that, that, those are the actual skills that a workplace would want. 
Now, that's not a multiple choice que question, but the multiple choice question, I believe, is dead. The other idea isn't about coding, uh, but it's about English class or history class. When all of us studied, the most common thing you'd do is read a book and then write an essay about it. Read the history book, write the essay, and then you're judged on the essay. We now know the computer can write that essay for us. Here's a different way to test did you learn, but also did you learn communication and collaboration skills. They can say, here's the book. You're on a debate team. Here's the question, and you don't know yet which side of that question you're going to need to debate. Prepare for both sides of that question. And you can read the book, or use the internet, or use AI, use whatever digital skills you want. But you better watch out for misinformation if you're using the internet or AI. You're going to need to work with your teammates and be ready to argue both sides of a position, because in this polarized world, you need to have an open mind to different beliefs. That is such a better way for preparing the next generation, and it will assess their knowledge of the subject, their digital skills, and also their teamwork. Yeah. What, are, what are some things that we need to, uh, what are some of the dangers of, of reformulating assessment for the, for the future? Are there any, any things that we should avoid? Ali, you mentioned there are some ethical concerns, maybe. Right. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit about, each of you, talk a little bit about um, some of the, the dangers, things we should, things society should avoid as we think about the future of assessment? Well, I think it's very clear that, uh, that there's a lot of things that are actually very easy to assess these days on a, on a student level. Um, but do they tell something about really the development of learning or development of that young person as a whole. Uh, I think what we must always keep in mind the, is the context, which actually where the teacher is the best ever artificial intelligent <laughs> in place. Because um, th there are like a lot of facial recognition technologies that can tell you that do you look engaged, but do they take into consideration what happened in the family in the morning? Right. Um, and, and there are kind of applications that are strongly connected to your health, and do they really tell about you as your growth as a person? I think that kind of challenges, we have to be careful not to go there. Yeah. Janet. I, I love that you mentioned the teacher, um, because I think one of the risks uh, of any kind of assessment is not preparing educators um, to know how to use the results of the assessments, not, know how, not knowing how to interpret those results, not knowing how to take action, appropriate action based on those results. And so um, I think preparing uh, the educators, the teachers, one, uh, on what the skills and competencies are that are going to be assessed in a, in a could be a simulation or a collaboration project, but but the curriculum needs to be uh, developed, and the and the educators need to be prepared to deliver that curriculum and be transparent that we're going to be assessing you on these skills in these ways, and then preparing teachers to know how to use those results. I think um, there has been in the past uh, stories of misuse of assessment results, uh, using data in ways that are um, keeping students out or preventing students from gaining opportunities, and I think we just need to be very careful that we're preparing our educators um, for this new form of assessment and, and, and actually take the time to create the curriculum and the space in the classroom to teach these kinds of soft skills that we've been talking about. One of the most critical elements of designing an assessment is to uh, reduce bias. When you're developing a test, especially one that is for scale, um, it's important to think about what are the, what's the criteria that's going into the design of it and, um, and, and to test it. You, you test it before you launch it. It's, um, without that testing and that rigor, it's very easy for a test to potentially be easier for men than women or for people from one culture versus another culture. And especially when you're offering assessments that can be global across different cultural contexts and different backgrounds and different family circumstances, uh, there's, there's bias that can be uh, unintended. 
And so those are the kinds of judgment calls that, especially in the early days of introducing AI-based uh, test development, it's important to have some human oversight uh, to ensure that we're modeling and really making sure that the statistical uh, um, you know, a bias is, is removed. That's, that, that's a really critical part of this. Yeah. I have a contrarian answer to this question about ethics. Really? And, and the reason I have this, it, it literally comes from the opening speech by the minister who stood on stage reading a speech written by AI and saying that his advisors caution him against doing this. I think the most unethical thing we could do wouldn't be changing the education system. It would be sticking with the curriculum of the past and forcing the next billion students to learn the same things without recognizing how much our world is being changed by technology. And I think this is a change that needs to come not only in the university system, but in primary and secondary education. And our leaders, education leaders of the world, need to have the courage to embrace change. Of course, they also need to think about those ethical implications, but the most unethical thing would be to just leave students in the same system that, that we grew up in. So what would be the first change you would make to an education system if you were suddenly put in charge of uh, a nation's uh, education system? What, what would be the first change you'd make based on these things you're saying? Well, I'm a little biased. My first change would be to make computer science part of the basic <laughs> core that a students should learn in, in basic education. And that's, that's the work that we do with governments. Uh, but I also would say that the as was said earlier, that the purpose of education is no longer to, to ingest information that, that you're being lectured with. The purpose of a teacher should be inspire, to inspire you to learn on your own, to develop lifelong learning skills, and to work on teams. And that's a very different way that our schools used to work. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a rethink. Uh, we need students to learn how to learn and learn how to keep up with technology as, as it evolves. And that's not how today's classroom works or what is being tested. Yeah. The first thing I would focus on is uh, the teacher. So much of the conversation on assessments has been around assessing students. But the opportunity is to reimagine what kinds of tools and support we can provide teachers before they enter the classroom, while they're in the classroom, and then how we can develop them and assess their skill progress while they're in school. And so just as Hari mentioned, and Janet referred to teachers as well, this increasing focus on the teacher at the center. And this is where some of the generative AI uh, can really help look at patterns of uh, how certain teachers are doing versus others. Because just like all of us, teachers are human. They have strengths in some areas. They have some blind spots in others. And providing that kind of support to help teachers provide equitable, fair, uh, consistent support for students across the board. And if you imagine this, you know, we have a tool called Praxis. Um, it's a test that uh, assesses teachers and provides credentials for teachers. And um, one of the things we're learning is using generative AI, complementing with the type of offering that we're having here, can produce different kinds of questions to really help support teachers. Um, so I would really, the first thing I would do is focus on assessments and tools that can help teachers be more effective in the classroom. Ali, how, how does the IB system assess teachers now? And um, what, what sorts of changes or, or tweaks would you make to, uh, to the system? Or could you foresee making in the future? Well, uh, I come, having been a minister for education in, in Finland for a long time, and, and our educational thinking and mine own to really comes to the standpoint that uh, assessing teachers is less important than trusting teachers. Mm -hmm. You can make sure that the teacher force are all qualified with master's level education and are capable of taking those pedagogical solutions that teacher autonomy gives them. But um, kind of, I, I see that there is, and that's what we are doing definitely, there's a need for have a system-wide uh, assessment how the system is functioning. 
But once you go to the level of individual teachers and start assessing them, um, there's a danger that the things that are you, you're able to assess are the ones that start thriving. And that means that the other things that you cannot assess are becoming less important. And I think in the core of the teacher profession is that interconnection, enabling that individual to grow and that group, that class to grow. And that is very difficult to, to really measure. And I would not like our teachers to kind of uh, stop paying attention to that. OK. Janet, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, Assessing I, teachers? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, I think one thing, I'm, I might get on my soapbox a little bit here, but I believe teaching is one of the most honored professions uh, that we have on our, on our planet. And we need to demonstrate the, the, the respect for the teaching profession just first off. Second, um, supporting teachers through their, their professional development in college as they get their certifications to teach, and then ongoing professional development and learning for teachers who are working um, to make sure they have the skills that they need to work with the students uh, for the skills that we're um, developing in, in, the, in the curriculum. I know from the work that ACT has done on, on durable skills assessments that um, the most critical and important component of assessing those soft skills is to provide professional development for the educators who are using that data to help develop students. And so professional development for, for, for teachers ongoing is critical, and I would put more emphasis on that than, than assessing teachers. Well, <clears throat> we only have a few, few seconds left. Um, to this conversation. Is there anything I haven't asked, any point that you want to make uh, about, about any of this that, uh, that we need to um, think about as we, as we leave today? I would just say that assessments reflect values. Mm -hmm. And at the heart of an assessment, you're really measuring something that you value. And so as we as society evolve with our educational needs, with our future of work. We're also evolving with how we're going to measure those uh, competencies and those ultimately those values. So it's important to recognize that underneath the curriculum and the teacher and the accountability measures are the underlying values that we as society really care about. And so as we're bringing up that next billion, um, making sure that we're having these kinds of conversations really front and center is going to be critical. Yeah. Well, thank you all for your time this morning. This was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. And thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.